Hey Living Rock family, whether this is your first time watching one of our sermons or you've been a part of Living Rock for many, many years, we are so glad that you clicked on our video today. We would love to hear from you after the sermon is over. Um, if God spoke to you through the message and laid something on your heart, share it with us. Send us an email or call us on the phone. We would love to know what God is doing through Living Rock Church for you. We'd also love the chance to connect with you. So like us on Facebook, follow us on Instagram, and check out our website for all of the events and things that we have going on in the church. You can also get connected with all of our ministries or with Pastor Ryan. There's so much we have to offer, and we can't wait to share it with you. Open your Bible this morning to the book of Malachi, chapter 4, and verse 2. But for you who revere my name, the Son of Righteousness will rise with healing in his wings. And you shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall. I didn't understand the, the calves part until I actually heard someone speaking on this verse who was a farmer and said that when calves are first let out in the spring, they jump and they just like the happiest they can be to be kind of let out of the stall. So I've never witnessed that, but this person who was speaking about this verse said they had. Jesus, who is the son of righteousness, however, Malachi says, describes him as the son of righteousness is rising on a new day. And I think it's important that we get the day that we're living in correctly. Because at the same time that Jesus is rising on a new day with healing in his wings, another day is setting. And Jesus will mention that in John chapter 5 and verse 35. And I want you to pay attention. He's speaking about John the Baptist. John the Baptist lived in another day, another period. And he says he was the lamp that was burning and was shining. And you were willing to rejoice for a while in his light. You are willing to rejoice for a while in his life. And we know John the Baptist and Jesus were relatives. John was Jesus' cousin. Uh, Elizabeth had, you know, witnessed the miracle within herself of the baby leaping when Jesus came into her home. So there was a relationship that was there. But Scripture prophetically is giving us insight into their lives and just how they are different. Christ comes, healing in his wings. John is the light that belongs to a day that is actually coming to an end. Now, John was a shining lamp. We know this from the scriptures. John's parents, we know, were Zechariah, Elizabeth. Zacharias was the priest, and the Bible tells us that they had no child, that she was barren. And while Zacharias was in the temple performing his priestly duties, he was visited by an angel. He was promised a son. And John will be, is of a priestly line. But John will seem to reject his priestly heritage and will choose rather the prophetic. And how many know there were two offices in the Bible that God worked through? And that was the priestly office, which held together a structure for services, ministered to the people, handled the offerings of the people, presented them to God. Priests functioned as kind of a mediator. But prophets functioned very differently. They issued warnings. They made declarations. Uh, they spoke what was true in the moment or sometimes alluding to truth that would come at a later date. And John belonged more to that group. Luke chapter 1 and verse 16 describes what John's ministry will be like. He will turn many of the sons of Israel back to the Lord, their God. It is he, talking about John now, who is a forerunner before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of fathers back to the children and the disobedient to the attitude of the righteous as to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. And as John got older, discovering that he, I guess, like all of us, we mature into our gifting. Uh, John moved to the wilderness and became part of a community there known as the Essenes. And these were a group of people who pretty much rejected the priesthood that was functioning in Jerusalem. 
What they saw there was hypocrisy. What they saw there was compromise. And so there was a group of these people who did not want to be associated with compromise, lived in the wilderness. John joined this community, and uh, this is where he would live. And as the scripture tells us, he would make his clothes out of camel's hair. He would eat uh, bugs, uh, would be his diet. And uh, he'd become kind of, a, kind of a living off the grid, so to speak. He became quite famous, however. And you'd wonder, someone living like that, how could they become So famous, that wasn't John's intention, but it was really his message that began to attract people. In Luke 3 and verse 3, it says he went into all the region around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, as it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet. So John will preach this message of repentance by the River Jordan. He will get quite popular. Great crowds will gather around him. Even very uh, powerful people would come. And here's what he would say to them when they would gather. Didn't matter who you were. What shall we do? And John replied, whoever has two tunics should share with the one who has none. Whoever has food should do the same. Even tax collectors came to be baptized, the scripture tells us. And teacher, they asked, what should we do? He said, collect no more than you are authorized to collect. And he answered, then some soldiers asked him, what should we do? Do not take money. By force. Don't use, in other words, don't use your office to extract money from people. He said, be content with your wage as a soldier. Now, those who repented, John would baptize in the Jordan. That was a symbolic act for the people of Israel to re-enter the promised land in a right way, in a right spirit, which I think is why John chose to do his baptizing at Jordan. We're going to re-enter the promised land, and we're going to do it right now in a spiritual way. But John and Jesus, it's important, are living very different lives. While John is preaching, and some estimate his ministry lasted only about a year, because prophets are always getting in trouble. They're always saying things they maybe shouldn't ought to say, or they say things that people don't like to hear. But Jesus is pretty much in Galilee with his father, working as a carpenter going to job sites with his dad. Carpentry then was not only with wood, but also with stone. And so they would live totally different lives. And yet one day, John would see his cousin, Jesus. Jesus would ask him to baptize him. And when John baptized him, the heavens would open. A dove would descend upon Christ, and a voice from heaven would say, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. A dove would light upon him. Jesus will just wring his hair out, walk toward the wilderness as he was led by the Holy Spirit to do so. And John would then say to his disciples, Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Things began to change from that day forward for John. John began to realize himself. As Jesus' crowds grew, After the wilderness, the 40 days in the wilderness, and Jesus went to Galilee, and then people began to gather around and hear Jesus' Sermon on the Mount and so on, John began to realize his lamp is burning out and that Jesus' lamp is burning brighter and brighter. John got in a lot of trouble. As I said, prophets were always notorious for saying the wrong things to the wrong people. John particularly got in trouble because he decided he would point out Herod's marriage to Herodias, Philip's wife, and uh, it was adultery. And John did not think that any Herod could be a Herod if they had committed adultery and broken the Torah law. How could we have a king of the Jews who violates the Mosaic law? And John was calling him out on it. Herodias was getting quite upset about all this, and he had, uh, Herod had John, uh, John arrested. And then it was while John was in prison, one of his own disciples came to him, and John decided he would ask this disciple, go ask Jesus, are you the one, or do we look for another? In other words, even though the scriptures had foretold a bright light is coming, For some reason, in John's mind, Jesus does not reflect the kind of Messiah 
that he was expecting. And I was thinking about that this week, how oftentimes when we begin to imagine our own futures, or we begin to imagine things that are going to unfold and happen, they rarely, if ever, happen the way that we imagine them. And we always experience a little bit of disappointment, I think, when we conjure up in our own minds what something's going to look like in the future or how a transition might take place. We might think that transitions are smooth, but they never and very rarely ever are. They're usually traumatic. There's usually a lot of tension when there's a transition taking place. There's, you know, as, the, as one day is beginning and another is coming to an end, if you're part of the one that's coming to an end, it's traumatic for you. <laughs> it's not your day anymore. It's not your moment to shine anymore. You're not the center of attention anymore. And this is very important, I think, that we grab a hold of this because it's John through the bars of a jail cell, arrested for doing God's work that he was called to do, to be prophetic, to call people to repentance, has gotten him incarcerated. And now from that jail cell, are you the one? Are you the expected one? Or shall we look for someone else? In other words, John is, am I getting this right or not? I mean, John has already professed. This is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. But John's not so sure. The way that Jesus is ministering is, is maybe the right way, or it, it looks different than what he thought. Because John is, you know, <clears throat> tough. Jesus is, is, is rumored that he's going into sinners' houses. That he's sitting down. In fact, people are even saying things like this. You know, John came neither eating or drinking, but Jesus, the wine bibber and a glutton. This is what people are saying. I think it's reasonable that John would question his cousin. I mean, after all, a few hundred years earlier, when Judah Maccabees rose up, and many thought he had messianic qualities, he got on a horse, he militarized the Jewish nation, and they rebelled. And there was a great battle. Is it, why am I still in prison, Jesus? When's the, when's the Calvary coming? You know, Calvary's not coming, John. Go tell John, is what Jesus told Andrew. Go tell him. The blind see. The deaf are hearing. The lame are walking. Go tell him that. The poor have the gospel preached to them. And then Jesus said this, and blessed is he who does not take offense at me. Jesus had been preaching to the poor, healing people. Go tell John that. You see, the kingdom of God, from when Jesus taught about the kingdom of God, he said it's like a seed that grows. We all know the seed when planted in the ground is some time before we even see any shoot come forth from the ground. It, it goes to a lonely time in the darkness. Jesus would describe his own ministry like that. Unless the kernel of seed, we'd fall into the ground and die, it abides alone. But if it dies, it brings forth much fruit. And he was speaking of his own death, burial, and resurrection. Jesus would say, the kingdom of God is like leaven. Like leaven that's put in, and it causes dough to rise. Jesus' ministry, in other words, John, my ministry is an inside-out ministry. People are being delivered, set free. It's a spiritual kingdom that I'm bringing. The kingdom of God, Jesus would say, is like a banquet where people are invited to attend. In other words, the kingdom of God, John, looks like restoration. It looks like forgiveness. It looks like resurrection. But it comes quietly in hidden ways. And then we know Finally, John is executed and kind of a, and, and murdered. And the light of John goes out, and his day is ended. I think it's important that we see the line that Jesus draws between his ministry and John's. In some ways, they're the same. They both preach repentance. They both preach the kingdom of God is here, coming. Prepare for it. Get ready. But Jesus was the shining lamp of a day that was beginning 
a star that was rising, healing in his wings. And John was a shining lamp in a day that was ending. Jesus' lamp is full of grace and truth. The crowd certainly knew that they were different. As I said, in Matthew 11, John came either neither, neither eating or drinking, and they say he has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say he's a gluttonous man and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. My thought this morning as we celebrate our Christmas Day worship this morning, that that's important to see which light is setting in our life and which light is rising. Because there's always both happening at the same time. In any transition in your life, there's one light that is painfully going out, but at the same time, there's a bright light that is, has healing in it that's rising in your life. I don't want to be sounding as if I'm living in a different day. There's a certain sound that we are to have even as the church in the new day that Christ has brought forth. There's a certain sound that sounds like, that sounds like his day. Then there's a sound that sounds like John's day. We need to make sure that we understand which day we're of. John came with threats and judgments and warnings like a traffic cop. He's keeping records. He's taking names. He's handing out tickets. You're a violator. You're a violator. And he's scaring people right down into the waters of baptism. And Jesus comes, as Paul would later say, it's the kindness of the Lord that leads us to repentance. The kindness of the Lord that leads us to repentance. Peter would say in his epistle, so we have the prophetic word made more sure to, the, to which you do well to pay attention as to a lamp in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star arises in your hearts. Peter likens the being born again, the welcoming of Christ as like a light that shines in a dark place and then rises in our hearts. Jesus announced a new kingdom. But he announced it with feasting. He announced it with, and said, rejoicing is what's required here for this new kingdom. Because why can we rejoice? Because it doesn't depend on us. My works, your works, do not do anything to earn us any favors with God. Our works don't count. Nothing. This is why we can rejoice. Because God's not looking out who's naughty and nice. God is saying, God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. Whosoever believeth in him shall have life. It's by faith and faith alone. And faith is counted as righteousness. That's what the scripture teaches us. This new kingdom is accessible by faith and by faith alone. And so Jesus comes to us as the great healer of our hearts. I'm grateful for the conviction of John. And early in my Christian walk, let me tell you, I needed John's preaching. I needed someone to scare the you-know-what out of me. I needed, I needed John. I needed that lamp, John, to be saying, Ryan, don't do that. That's going to hurt you. That's going to hurt somebody else. I mean, just recently, I was with my grandson, and we were walking through the woods behind our house, and my neighbor came out, and he said, did y'all lose one of these? He held up an arrow. We had a little target things set up in the backyard. I think one of the arrows had gotten astray and ended up in my neighbor's yard. He found it, brought it over to us. We talked for a few minutes. But it reminded me when, I, when that happened that that's exactly what sin is in our life. The word sin, hamratai, in the Old Testament means to miss the mark. What we don't realize is that we're not just competing with ourselves. When we miss the mark, arrows go astray and other people get hurt. Arrows go astray, and next you don't know where they're going to end up. You don't know whose yard they're going to be in. You don't know who's going to get stuck. I need a John. Ryan, aim for the target. But then Jesus comes along and says, no matter how hard you try to hit the target, it's not going to save your soul. No matter how hard you try to hit the goal, it's not going to save your soul. I came to save your soul. Believe in me, have faith in me, and you'll have life. So Jesus teaches us about sin from a physician's perspective. That sin will kill you if you don't let me heal you. 
Sin will kill you if you don't let me heal you. There are times and seasons in life when the old order, which wasn't bad, because it was necessary to alert us to really the new thing that God wants to do in our life. And it's important that we compare the two. But don't think for a moment that that transition is experienced as fun. John died. John was murdered. Cruelly. As transition came. That even he himself would recognize from that jail cell. He must increase. And I must decrease. He recognized his place and which day he lived in. Transitions are anxiety inducing. But there's another part of you that says when you see the light of the new day, this is what I've been waiting for my whole life. This is the gospel I've been wanting to preach my whole life. And I have to know, in prophets, when, when Jeremiah became a prophet in the Old Testament, God told him, I'm going to teach you what to tear down and what to build up. They tore down things, but they also built up things. You've got to know the difference between what God is tearing down in your life and what God is building up. And John has that realization. I must decrease. My time is over. These are important words if you're going through a spiritual transition. And I want to say, I just believe that God is opening a window for us as a church, um, for us as individuals, to transition on this Christmas day into a new way of being in this world and with one another. The old form of things, which wasn't bad, was necessary, must now decrease. So the new thing that God wants to do in your life can increase. God may use the burning lamp of yesterday to highlight things that need to be brought down in your life. Convict you of sin where your arrows have gone astray. The preaching of John that brings me to repentance, change my direction, go down into the waters of baptism was all so that I could actually hear the good news of Christ's resurrection, of the life of the Holy Spirit that God wants to now live in me. John, who prepared you for the now, is gone. Let us pray that we become aware of what needs to decrease in our life and what needs to increase in our life. It'll be different for all of us. I pray we know the difference. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word this morning on this Christmas day. Two lamps burning at the same time, John and Jesus. But one was going out and one would burn brighter and brighter. And one would illuminate us. Proverbs says that the spirit of the man is the candle of the Lord. Psalmist also says the path of the righteous shines brighter and brighter and brighter to the full day. Some, Lord, in this hour are ready to write the church off, saying that the, it's over. People imagine a kingdom. As, as, as John Lennon did years ago in the song, No Religion. I, I don't want a world without religion. I don't want a world without God. I don't want a kingdom without you in it. You are the reason. You're everything. So God, I pray on this Christmas day that your kingdom will come into every heart every mind, that we will make room as we sung earlier in our hearts for you today. That wherever, God, we go, not just here in this church, not just in our own relationships that we treasure and nurture, but even with those, Lord, and we may be estranged, that we'll be kind, gentle, healing, healing in your wings. That will make us healers, Lord, in a broken world. 
restorers of that which has been broken down, menders of what's been torn, living in peace with one another. We pray this in Jesus' name. Lord, and as we individually recognize transition in our own life, where, where certain things are, are diminishing or are passing away, and let us pay attention to the light that is spot burning brighter and brighter in our life. Let us put our attention on that, Lord, and not focus on what was and what was lost or what had been, but focus on where we're going now and what the future is and where you're leading us, Lord. For therein is the new day. Therein is the healing. Therein is the joy. We thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen.